And we're going to continue our study of Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Um, as I said, a lot of um, the material that I'm using is actually from a lecture from one of my professors um, at the University of Jerusalem. And um, today we're going to dive into um, some background for you. Okay, I always feel that it's good that we have background on why Paul is using certain things, why Paul is saying certain things, and just to help you understand that the Bible was written from a Jewish perspective. We forget that. We somehow think that the New Testament is just that, and all it is is an extension of what's been written in the Old Testament. There's nothing in the New Testament that is not in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the reference to build the case that Jesus is the promised Messiah that Jerusalem, or I should say that the Israelites, have been waiting for. I titled today's message, What Does It Mean to Be Saved? And my intent was to get through verses 1 through 13. Unfortunately, um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think I'm going to cut off at verse 8 today. But Paul is going to continue his discourse in chapter 10 on why Israel has not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Remember that these three chapters are dealing specifically with Jesus or with the Jews' rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, and that Paul is speaking to Roman believers and saying, hey, look, you're to have grace for them. This is the issue that's going on with them, but God has a bigger plan for them, right? And so Paul is going to approach this problem by citing Israel's scripture, the, 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 the sacred writings, and over half of the verses in chapter 10 are going to come out of what's called the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible. Now, the Tanakh is kind of like the updated version of the Hebrew scriptures, and it includes three sections. You have the Torah, you have the Nivium, and you have what's called the Ketuvim. And these texts are almost exclusively in biblical Hebrew. However, you have Daniel and Ezra who are written in Aramaic. Why? Because both Daniel and Ezra were in the exile, and so they, they were, the, their writings were in the language that was spoken at the time of where their exile was at. Now, the word Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K-H, is an acronym for the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible. You take the Torah, the Nevium, and the Ketuvim, and, and you take a couple of letters from each one of those words, and that's how you come up with the Tanakh, right? That's how they, I mean, it's just simple. It's an acronym. Now, as I said, it's made up of three divisions. The first is the Torah. The Torah, what is that? Well, Torah literally means teaching. That's what the word means, teaching. And it's also known as the Pentateuch in the Greek version of the, uh, Isra of the Israel scriptures, or some call it the five books of Moses. So the Torah is the first five books. It's not the whole Hebrew Bible. It's only the first five. <coughs> Excuse me. Nevium. Nevium means prophets. And it's the second main division in the Tanakh. Now, this division includes the books which cover the time from Israel's possession of the promised land all the way through their captivity in Babylon, okay? And so it's referred to as the period of the prophets or the period of prophecy. Now, there's three sections to the uh, Nedevim. You have what's called the former prophets. This is the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. <coughs> Can somebody give me some water, please? I'm so sorry. Then you have what's called the latter prophets, okay? This is Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. <coughs> and then you have what's called the 12 minor prophets, which is really considered to be one book. And that's made up of Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, right? And so you have those divisions that are within the Nevabim. And the third division of the Hebrew Bible is what's called the Ketuvim, and this consists of 11 books. These are called the poetic books. Anybody know what a few of the poetic books might be? So you have Psalms, right? Proverbs, Job. Job's considered a poetic book. Then you have what's called the five scrolls. Now, each one of these books 
are read during one of the festivals or celebrations that the Jews have yearly. So, Song of Songs, or also known as the Song of Solomon, typically is read on Passover. The Book of Ruth is typically read on Shavuot. The Book of Lamentations is read on Tisha B'Av. Ecclesiastes is, re- is read on Sukkot, and Book of Esther is read during the celebration of Purim, one of my favorite celebrations. <laughs> Can't explain that now. Now, besides the three poetic books and the five scrolls, the, re- the remaining books in the Ketuvim are Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. And although there is no grouping for these books in Jewish tradition, they nevertheless share some distinguishing characteristics, and here's what they are. Their narratives are all openly describing relatively late events. So they speak about the Babylonian captivity. They speak about the restoration of Zion during the, uh, at, the, at the end of the millennium. All right, The Talmudic, which is an earlier version of the Hebrew Scriptures, Tradition ascribes that the authorship is late, and it is. Daniel and Ezra were were written after Isaiah and Jeremiah. So again, they were written later on um, uh, than the other prophets were. And their their narratives, right, their narratives um, are always describing prophetic events, and typically they're describing events towards the end of, of when Jesus' return happens. As I said, two of them, Daniel and Ezra, are the only books in the Tanakh that are written in Aramaic. So why am I telling you this, right? I didn't come here, pastor, to, to go to seminary. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand why Paul writes what he writes and where he's getting his information from. The Western church, we've... We've narrowed our, our, our sights to just this much. We put God in a box. This is who God is. We compartmentize God. We don't understand that there's a plethora of information. There's a plethora of things out there that the, the apostles were drawing on that we don't draw on. And so I want to help you understand why Paul writes what he writes in Romans chapter 10. So Paul uses biblical support to underscore his assertion That Messiah, Jesus, is the goal of the Torah. And we're going to see that in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. Jesus is the goal. Jesus was the end result. And so let's go to Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1. And it reads, (coughs) excuse me, brothers, my desire, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Again, if you remember, Paul said in chapter 9 of Romans, he said he wished that he could be accursed if it would allow the Israelites, his fellow Jews, to come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice something here. Paul has this deep concern about his fellow Jews not having belief in Jesus. But I want you to grasp this, church. The rejection of the gospel does not make Paul angry. Instead, it makes him prayerful. He says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they be saved. Listen, church, grasp this truth. When people reject the gospel message when we present it, we're not to take it personally, we're to take it prayerfully. We need to go back and we need to pray for that person. We need to pray for that heart to be open. We need to pray for that mind to be open. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit would encompass that person's being and reveal that Jesus is truly the Messiah. Verse 2, For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God, and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Church, when we see that word zeal, especially modern readers, the thought might come to the zealots who were the uh, first century sect that were very violent, they were very rebellious, or perhaps Paul, 
who had zeal in persecuting the assembly of Jesus' followers. And we see Paul talk about this in Philippians chapter 3, 6. And so therefore, we might interpret Israel's zeal as being something bad. But here's the thing. Zeal is good, church, when it's directed toward God. And Israel had zeal for God. They did, did they not? They, were, they, were, they had zeal. They, listen, they wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to please God. Paul says, I bear witness to this zeal. Paul himself was zealous. He said he was. I was zealous in persecuting the church. Paul was committed to persecuting the church because he felt that he was doing the right thing. He felt he was doing it for God. Church, sometimes our hearts are misplaced in what we're doing for God. We have to check our hearts, man. Right heart, wrong motive. Sometimes our motives are wrong. We, we want to please God, but our motivation is wrong. And that's what was happening with the nation of Israel. Now, it says here that they had zeal for God, but it says, but not according to knowledge. Now, this word knowledge, the word in the Greek is epig gnosis and it's where we get the word gnostic that's where the word gnostic comes and so epignosis means knowledge and 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 the gnostics what who were the gnostics does anybody know who remember who the gnostics were huh? the, the gnostics are in scripture we read about them in revelation paul writes about them uh, john in fact is going to address them in one of his letters but the gnostics were a sect that had infiltrated the church and they believed that they were sinless they believed they had no sin I'm, I'm going to go off track here a little bit because this has been on my heart all morning. And I told Mama Bear, I said, you know, I don't know if God's going to want me to say this, but, but I'm going to do it. Okay, I'm going to talk about this real quick. Um, and here's why. Because I believe that someone today in this room or with an earshot of my voice is struggling with forgiveness. You're struggling with it. You're struggling with forgiveness. And it's because you have a misunderstanding of what Scripture says about forgiveness. As I said, the Gnostics believed they had no sin. Now, a lot of people don't understand this or know this, but John chapter 1, verse 1, or chap, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 1, that whole chapter is directed to the Gnostics that were in the church. It was directed at them. It wasn't directed at us. It was directed at Gnostics. Let me tell you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 states, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we, we take this verse here and we build a doctrine on it. A doctrine has been built on this verse. And here's what the verse, and here's what it is. I have to continually go to God and, and, and confess my sins, otherwise he's, I, I, I'm not going to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. This is the only verse in the Bible that talks about this. There's no other verses that talk like this. So why did John write this? Why? Because if you go to John chapter 1, verse 8, it says this. If we say we have no sin, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Listen, the Gnostics believed they were sinless. Because they thought they were sinless, they, Paul says, if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving ourselves. Who in this room thinks they have no sin? Right? We all know we're sinners saved by grace. So what John was saying to them is this. You're deceiving yourselves, Gnostic group. You're deceiving yourselves into thinking that you have no sin. He says, so what you need to do is you need to confess that you have sin, see your need for Jesus, and God will be faithful and just to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. That's why Paul pins what he pins, or John pins what he pins. Listen, some of you are struggling for, with forgiveness for a sin you committed many years ago. Something that you did many years ago. You keep coming back to God and asking forgiveness for it. 
God, please forgive me for that. Please forgive me for that. Please forgive me from that. And what you need to understand is that our loving Heavenly Father does not forgive us in installments. Depending on how diligently we confess our sins. Oh, if I really confess it this time, God's going to forgive me. Man, I got it now. I've, I've worked it out, right? Fellowship with God is not broken because our forgiveness is not contingent on what we do. It's contingent on the finished work of Jesus. Amen? That's how it works. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't get our hearts right before the Lord. But we don't confess our sins to be forgiven. Listen, we confess our sins or speak openly to our gracious Father because we are already forgiven. That's the difference. That's the difference. See, we need to change how we think about forgiveness. We need to think from God's perspective and not our perspective. We are forgiven. When we asked Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, when we accepted him, when we believed that Jesus was raised from the dead, we were sealed and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. And when we come to Christ with a mindset that we are already forgiven, Satan can't work against us. See, how many times has Satan brought up your past? How many times does he infiltrate your heart and your mind and tear you apart, rip you wide open about something that you did? Something that you did so long ago that you almost can't remember until he comes and reminds you. Ephesians 1.7, if we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, oh, I'm sorry, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Church, you understand? In him we have redemption through his blood. We're redeemed. We already have the forgiveness of sins, and it's according to the riches of his grace. It's according to what he's done on the cross. We can't, we can't earn it, man. We can't earn it. Listen, if confession of sin was vital to the believer for forgiveness, then Paul did an injustice in writing his epistles. Not once in his letter does he mention that confession of sin is vital for the forgiveness of the believer. Now, don't get it twisted. When you mess up, you need to go get right with God. What I'm saying is that you're not coming to God and having a beg fest. You're coming to God, and you're saying, Lord, I messed up, man. What I did was stupid, and God, you need to change me in that area, but thank you that I'm forgiven. Do you see the difference? Then, oh, my God, I'm worthless. Kill me. I'm terrible. I'm the worst person on earth. You are. So am I. Live with it. But my point is this. It's your, perf it's your perspective on forgiveness. Somebody today needs to understand that you are forgiven, that Jesus loves you, that he, 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 there's nothing he won't do for you because he's already done it for you, man. He wants you to let go and let him have it, and he wants to infiltrate your heart and your mind, and he wants to bring relief to your spirit and your soul. Man, he wants to put salve on that wound. He wants to take your memory and release it. Man, he wants to change you. He wants to take and let you know that you are forgiven beyond measure. That's it. That's it, man. So I'm sorry I get off my soapbox now, but man, I just know somebody's hurting today, man, and you need to let go. So Paul says that they had a knowledge, right? But it's the wrong knowledge. Like the Gnostics, they got it wrong. He also says in verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God. So they were ignorant. Now the word there in the Greek is actually agnoeo, which means unaware. And it's where we get the word agnostic in the English, right? You see how that plays? Agnos agnostics, what are they? They're unaware or ignorant of the existence of God. They say God doesn't exist. They're, 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 God, what? They're unaware. So what is Paul saying? He says they had a passion and a zeal for God, but not the knowledge of what that meant. 
because they lacked the knowledge, they were unaware of what true righteousness of God was. They tried to attain it on their own rather than to submit to God's righteousness. Man, I'm telling you, I, I, I fall into that sometimes. So how does Paul know that Torah-observant Israelites who do not follow Jesus have not submitted themselves to God? How does he know? Well, this, the answer is simple. What do you think? <laughs> right. He says, listen, if they had submitted themselves to God and his righteousness, they'd be following Jesus. Since according to Paul, following the Torah by faith should lead to trust in Jesus. What does Hebrews tell us? Faith comes by what? Hearing. Do you understand that every single Sabbath that they read the scriptures aloud in the synagogue, they read them aloud. They expounded them. They heard the word of God. And Paul's point is, if you had heard the word of God and really understood the word of God and really heard what God was saying, then you know what? You would be in a relationship with Jesus. That's how Paul got there. He meets Christ on the road. He meets Jesus on the road. Jesus doesn't give him a gospel message. He asks him a question. Why do you kick against the goads, man? Why are you coming against me? He doesn't say, I died for your sins. I was raised from the dead. And I sit at the right hand of the Father. And I'm here to forgive you, Paul. He asks Paul a question. And Paul responds, who are you, Lord? Because in that moment, in that moment, Paul saw Jesus for who he was, and he responds accordingly. And Paul was never the same man. And Paul was the instrument that brought the gospel message to the Gentiles. So Paul understood how Scripture was important to understanding who Jesus was. This is why he writes what he writes in Romans. He's using Scripture to make his point. Romans 10.4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, this word end, the word in the Greek is, is goal. That's the word in the original text of the Septuagint. So Christ is not the end, but he's the goal. That was the goal. The, everything in the in the Old Testament, everything in the law was to bring people to a, re a realization that Jesus was who he says he is. That was the goal. Christ is the end result, but it was the goal the whole time. And reading and understanding the Hebrew scriptures should have led the Jews to Christ. That's Paul's whole point. So if you take chapter 9, verses 30 and 32... And then you take Romans chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, you get a better idea of what Paul was saying. Now remember, when Paul wrote, wrote Romans, it was a letter. Chapters and, and, and verses, the numbering, that didn't happen for almost a thousand years. So this was all one thought, all one idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it to you in the original text. This is how it was originally written in the Greek. It says, Israel, who pursued a righteous Torah, did not arrive in Torah. Why? Because not out of faith, but as though out of works, for being unaware of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit themselves to God's righteousness. For Messiah is the goal of Torah in righteousness to all who believe. Does that make sense? Right? Jesus was the goal. And, and the Jews missed it. Why? Because they were trying to work their way to righteousness rather than having faith in God for righteousness and having faith in God in following the law. That was their problem. Now, 
One thing I want to kind of make clear here, because I've talked about, well, in the original language and this in the real text, okay, listen, I want to make something clear. When the translators for the Bible worked on Scripture, they would sometimes change a word for it to make more sense to their readers. Simple, right? End instead of goal, okay? And this doesn't change what's being said, church. It doesn't change anything. Whether Jesus is the end result or the goal, it doesn't matter. It's still Jesus, right? But it was done so that the reader could get a better sense of what was being said. Another example, a few years back, if you remember, we were, I, w- I can't remember exactly what teaching I was doing, but I talked about Jason, uh, Jason, uh, Jason Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Ugh, let me get it out there, <laughs> right? I told you Jesus was a mason. He wasn't a carpenter. Anybody that's been to Israel knows that the place is full of dirt and stone. And if you understand the history of at Jesus' time, wood was scarce. Do you remember when they built the temple? They had to have the wood shipped in. Jesus was a mason. He worked with stone, right? But when they translated the Bible into the King James Version, the translator said, hey, <laughs> our dumb people, they aren't going to know what a mason is, but they'll know what a carpenter is. And so they used the word carpenter. It doesn't change anything. Jesus was a builder. He worked with his hands. Right? Isn't that what Jesus is a builder. He builds us. He works with his hands. We are the work of his hands, church. So it doesn't change anything, Right? People, oh, the King James Version is the only true version of the Bible. Do you know how many words in the King James Version, if I use them today, people will go like, what did you just say? You just said that? Hey, it would be terrible, right? Let's don't get caught up on the translations, church. <laughs> Let's get caught up on the Word itself. Let's get caught up on what the Word is about. It's about Jesus. Now, There's another source that Paul used in his writing of Romans, and it was called the Book of 1 Maccabees. And Maccabees supports Paul's contention that for Jews to follow God rightly, the Torah observance must be done out of faith. Now, 1 Maccabees is not in modern Jewish or Protestant Bibles. However, it is in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of Israel's Bible, And therefore was a part of Paul's manuscripts that he used in writing Romans. Okay? Now the second temple text provides a temple of Paul's exposition about the need for a Jewish person to observe Torah from the position of trust in God rather than trust in self. And so I want to cite some of the passages of Scripture out of Maccabees that Paul uses. 1 Maccabees chapter 1 verse 2 52, or chapter 2, verse 52. Was Abraham not found faithful when tested, and, was, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? That's Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Came out of 1 Maccabees. Chapter 2, verse 58 and 59. Elijah, because of great zeal for Torah, was taken up into heaven. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael had faith and were saved from the fire. Now, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they were the three Hebrews that were thrown into the furnace by Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 2, verse 61, from generation to generation, none of those who put their faith in God will lack strength. We've all heard these. 264, my children, be courageous and grow strong in the word. So how does one arrive in Torah according to 1 Maccabees? By making faith in God the engine of one's observance, rather than leaning on one's ability to perform God's commands. That's the difference. That's the difference. So according to 1 Maccabees and Romans, one arrives in Torah by following the Torah out of faith in God. Torah observant was not the end in itself, but rather the end or goal of the Torah was faith in God and specifically faith in Jesus. Paul reasons to the Roman believers that if his fellow Jews were making trust in God primarily in their Torah observance, instead of acting as though it were out of their own works, their Torah observance would lead them to Jesus because the Messiah 
is the goal. Romans chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith does not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So here, Paul now is quoting out of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. And he's using the words of Moses to bring about his point about what righteous faith looks like. What does it look like? To to live righteously, right? To to live a, a righteous existence and to live it by faith, what does that look like? Well, it's simple, church. It's based on Jesus. It's just based on Christ. And what he's saying here is we don't have to work to get to Jesus. We don't have to ascend into heaven. We don't have to descend into the abyss to gain Jesus. We just have to believe and receive. That's it. But again, the mindset of the Jews was that we had to work our way to God. We had to, we had to do certain things to get to God. Some of you this morning are stuck in that mindset, man, and you need to get out of it. There is nothing you're going to do that's going to change the love of God for you. It's unceasing. It's unchanging. He loves you. He loves you like you are. He's not going to keep you like you are because he loves you and he wants you to change, but he still loves you like you are. That's it. It's not anything else. I can't get to Jesus, but Jesus can get to me. And that's what it's about. I can't get into heaven. I can't get into the depths of the earth. But man, I don't need to because Jesus is going to extend himself to me. And Paul writes, the word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Do, do you and I believe that? Do we believe that the word is near you? Who is the word? The word is Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus is in your mouth and in your heart? When you speak, does Jesus resonate with your speech? When you think, does Jesus resonate in your thinking? Does, Je does Jesus resonate in your heart? Does he have resonance in your heart? He says that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Jesus is the word of faith that we proclaim, not the law, not works, not anything else. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. I remember my good friend, Mike McKinney, who came here one day to preach in the church. And he said something profound I'll never forget. He said, if you did not share Jesus with somebody that day, you did not do your job for the day. And that's deep. We're so busy about our lives that we forget where to be sharing Christ. We forget where to be sharing Christ. Our job is to share Jesus. Well, use, use words if necessary. What was that, a, a CC thing, you know? Uh, oh, uh, you preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. I'm sorry, but you still have to use words. I don't see a silent gospel. Right? I know some people that don't know Jesus are the nicest people in the whole world. They are so kind and so sweet and so nice, but they don't have Jesus. Right? You got to use your mouth. We're going to talk about that next week. Right? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Oh, that's that whole verse is a perverse on its own, man. Listen, I want to end with this today. And I know I'm all over the place, man. I'm still loopy after my surgery. But here's the thing. We don't always understand God's plan. The Romans did not understand God's plan. The Romans did not understand how, after 15 years, I'm supposed to embrace these, these Jews that are coming back and infiltrating us, and they're still doing the Passover, and they're still celebrating all these types of things. 
No, we don't need them anymore. We've replaced the Jewish nation, which is a theology, uh, the, the, the replacement theology that is from the pit of hell. That is not biblical. Show me in the Bible where it says that. We don't know God's plan. We may not understand God's plan. You may not understand his plan for your life right now, but here's what you need to do. You need to lean into Jesus. You need to keep yourself leaning into Jesus. And when you lean into Christ, you don't have to worry about what the plan is. Because when I'm leaning on Jesus, all I got to do is lean and follow. Lean and follow. Lean and follow. I don't have to do nothing else, man. Nothing else. There'll be men and women up here to pray for you this morning. If you need to get things right in your heart, man, come up here and get some prayer. Man, if you don't know Jesus, come up here. We'll talk to you about it. He wants to have a real relevant relationship with you. If you want to know how to be a great drummer, go talk to this guy right here. <laughs> He'll give you drum lessons. <laughs> um, again, I'm sorry about today. I, I, I'm really, I'm foggy today, and so um, I'm struggling, and uh, that's not fair to you guys, but... Um, uh, praying that next week I'll have a little bit more clearer head. and Because uh, Romans chapter 10, 9 is essential for us as believers, and we need to understand what it really means. Um, it's more than just a simple prayer. I think we've led a lot of people to hell over a simple prayer. It's way more than that, and it's way deeper than that. Jesus' death on the cross is not some simple thing. It was deep, and it cost him everything. Father, thank you for this day. I pray that you would bless us, Lord, with your presence all day. Thank you for the blessing of being our Lord and Savior, God, and we thank you for your love and grace in our lives. You're so merciful and so good. Thank you, Lord, for um, man, just letting us be part of the family and uh, the benefits that come with that. They're amazing. And uh, bless all those um, that are here, that are listening. Bless all the other Bible teaching churches today, God. I just pray, Lord, that it was a beautiful and amazing time for your people as they gathered in all these different places. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.